everybody, um, and thank you very much for joining us. My name is Viola Rudat, and I am the International Distribution Manager at Unchained Labs. I'll be your moderator today, and I'm very glad you decided to hang out with us for the hour today. Um, most of all of you are in places where we sell through local distributors, and I will tell you a little more specifics about this in the end. Um, but I also just want to mention, I think today doing this put very particular and more challenging time, um, this particular setup will make it much easier for us um, to ensure your local support through our distributors. Meanwhile, all of us at Unchained Labs are of course also available. Uh, don't hesitate to get in touch anytime. You can contact your distributors for application support, product questions, uh, service needs, uh, and even perhaps get some virtual product demonstration um, as you're interested. We, will, we are all ready to do everything we can do to help you. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We ask you, you have a chat box and a Q&A box. We would appreciate if you try to use the Q&A box. It's in the Zoom navigation bar, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your device, and type in that question. Um, we far will answer as many of those as possible, and everything else we will answer later on in writing. With all of this being said, I would like to introduce Vifan Jean Gilles. Um, he will take us today through a presentation that discusses the Unchained Labs tools that can help you in the development of AAVs, VLPs, and other vaccines and help you characterize them. Rifar, it's, it's your floor. Thank you, Viola. Excellent. So I thought I would start today's discussion by showing you a picture, if you want, of COVID-19, right? I think it's pretty appropriate. Most of us for the past few months have been impacted by it. And I think it's worth to, to take a look at it, but also to just kind of deconstruct this, this particle that's been um, ubiquitous in all of our lives, right? So if you look at it, it's really just a ball with a bunch of surface receptors, typically proteins, and then some other factors or components that are going to be uh, relevant and we'll be discussing those in the next few slides. But I just wanted to start with this one to put things in perspective because we give viruses a bad name, but certainly there's a whole different way to think of them, particularly in the world that we live in today, okay? And so I'm going to start with this slide here. You may recognize this from the movie Troy, and this is essentially the so-called Trojan horse, right? And as the story goes, um, essentially the, um, the Greeks donated uh, this horse to the city of Troy as an attempt to essentially gain access to their, their city to get within the wall. And so if you look at the imagery that we're putting forth here, it's now used to a virus where this, this object is able to enter because it actually looks the part, right? It has all the right features. Um, it looks like a horse. It looks like a big, massive sculpture that's, you know, meant to be there as a, as a gift within the city. And so it's taken in. But as we know from the story, right, the real payload, the real catch here resides within the actual horse itself, right? And as the story goes, the soldiers were hiding within the actual belly, if you want, of the, um, of the horse. And when nighttime came, they made their way out of it and they essentially took over the village. And that's the city. And that's essentially what we do with viruses, right? Whether we realize it or not, they're essentially a very nice vector or can do it to enter into cells and then they deliver their payload, nucleic acids. And then from there, they're able to take over the functions of the cells and essentially do whatever it is that they are trying to do. And that's a bit of the analogy that I want to start with today, okay? So viruses really are not all that bad when we think of them. And so when you and I think about gene therapy, right, that's the other major area of interest this year for most of us, it's really done with viruses nowadays, right? And so the idea is exactly the same, which is that the, the overall arcing goal of gene therapy is to be able to simply deliver nucleic acid materials to a cell and allow it to make its own protein or to correct a function that it doesn't have or to actually simply um, do away with some adverse effects that, that's currently malfunctioning in that cell. And so the example here, you can actually see the example of a virus approaching a cell, entering the membrane. Once it enters, it's deliver, it, it delivers each gene, right? And that gene is able to, again, take over the machinery of the protein to make, of the cell to make new proteins, which are then used for 
uh, for hopefully the, the betterment of, of the patient. So there's also some examples, but here's an example here of Zolgensma, which is a spinal muscle atrophy virus, right? A therapeutic that's actually been FDA approved that's currently in the market, right? And so I think I'm saying that to make one very clear point, which is that viruses are not all that bad, but certainly they're being used today. And so the more we understand them, the better we have a hold on gene therapy, but also what you or your customers may end up doing as they're trying to develop new therapeutics. And so if we take a closer look at the overall uh, design philosophy around vaccines, the idea is really to replicate the different components of functions of a virus for the most part. And so if you can think about breaking down a vaccine or virus, sorry, into its different parts, right, you can actually simply think that if you can mimic some of those components, you're able to then induce the same exact response that you would if you had a proper live virus by you know, any organism, and that will essentially help, help you develop some sort of um, immune response and the ability to cope with, uh, with, with a malady of some sort. Okay? And so there's an example here of a whole inactivated virus. So this is an example for polio, for instance. Whereas for BCG, you actually had a live but attenuated virus that was used. And then the case all the way at the bottom where you see the case of an adjuvant where some factors or toxoids were used and that's one of the ways that we treat tetanus, for instance, or diphtheria, right? And so the idea should make it very clear that viruses are obviously not that bad, but more importantly, there's a very intelligent approach to leveraging what they do in the delivery of therapeutics, okay? And so if we really take that analogy a step further, if you've seen the movie Avengers, right, and you may have noticed that there were quite a significant cast of characters, but if you look at behind the scenes of any movie, there's often a set of actors are simply there to essentially do the hard stunts, right? And we normally call them stunt doubles, and they have really one function or one qualification is that they have to look the part, right? They have to look like the main actor. And so these are examples of various actors with their stunt doubles. And as you can tell, if you look very closely, they're not exactly perfect copies of the actors, but really all they have to be is simply close enough, right? And if they're close enough to look like them, then when you and I look at the movie, we don't see the difference when you switch from one and the other. And that's essentially what viruses and vaccines do. If you're able to create a mimic of some components of a, vac of a virus as a vaccine, then your body says, okay, it looks close enough. I'm going to begin to create some factors or some antibodies against those. And by the time you get, you know, you face the real thing, you're able to be much more, um, you're much more well suited to, to combat it and, and therefore overcome that, that disease. Okay, and so that's the analogy here. And so to that effect, one of the approaches that people take consists of so-called VLPs. So again, if you take a closer look at one of the VLPs being developed for, you know, in the fight against COVID-19, you may see again that the features here are pretty, pretty interesting, right? Where you get your membrane, you get some protein at the very top, and then you have this core central section here, which in this case is hollow, but you could imagine putting some nucleic acid in there, or you may simply rely on the surface proteins to trigger an immune response, and that should be sufficient for, for what you're trying to do, okay? And so as you think of this, right, as you think about the idea of leveraging viruses as vaccines for therapeutics, right, you can really begin to put things in perspective, and that really, to me at least, wrap up the, the ensemble of what's been happening over the last decades, which is that biologics have taken over the way we handle therapeutics. So if you and I had met maybe 10, 15 years ago, right, we've been mostly concerned with chemicals, right? Small molecules are synthesized. And nowadays, most of our therapeutics are biologics, meaning that they are derived from biological molecules and they are either proteinaceous or viral or nucleic acid based typically. And they are going to essentially function in the ways that those type of molecules do. And those are examples of that where you can see Remicade, you can see Receptin, the breast cancer therapeutic. And finally, on the right hand side, you can see another virus that is also and FDA approved therapeutics, right? So they are very interesting and they offer very unique properties and opportunities to approach uh, the way we treat diseases differently because they're much more specific, right? And the way they are produced and the way they are handled offer very interesting benefits to, to our patients. However, they're a bit challenging, right? They offer quite a new set of challenges, if you want, or hurdles that we have to overcome when it comes to characterizing them, right? So certainly you have to identify them, you have to be mindful of keeping track of the function, but then you have to also keep track of the so-called stability, right? And that's going to be the big one for us. The idea of how do we characterize stability, how do we assess potency and impurities, right? And how do we do so in the context of 
large molecules, right? Which is a very different way than we used to do it for small molecules, right? And so I want to really keep things relatively simple. I think when you and I think of viruses, we tend to have this reaction where we think you have to be an expert virologist to really understand this, this, this new domain. And you really don't. But if you think about it in a very simple way, it is nothing more than an ensemble of components that you and I are very familiar with, right? A protein is nothing more than a big ball with proteins on the surface, right? That's where the virus is, a big ball with proteins on the surface and with nucleic acid in the middle. So typically RNA or DNA. And then on the surface, you're going to have glycoproteins, you'll have receptors, right? You may have antigens. And the ensemble of all of that form this big particle that usually you have to worry about its structure and whether or not it's sticking to one another, and we call that aggregation or the so-called colloidal stability, okay? And so if you can keep that mindset over the next few slides, you're going to see exactly how we can characterize that using some very interesting tools um, and really take advantage of this, what we already know essentially about proteins, about DNA, or nucleic acid in general, and of course, particle characterization, which you have done um, if you work with biologics over the past five or 10, 15, 20 years or so. So I wanted to also really put things in perspective, right? So as we break down those three components, right? If you think about proteins, the thing that you and I care about is the fact that they are, they are made up of amino acids. Specifically, they're made up of aromatic amino acids, which means that we have tryptophans. And if we have tryptophans, you will normally measure the concentration by UVBs using an E280, right? The absorbance at 280 nanometers. And therefore, that should make it fairly easy for you to approach the characterization of the samples. And what's interesting is the mere fact that you can measure them by A to AD also means that you can also characterize them by fluorescence because the exact same amino acid also has the ability to be excited intrinsically, so without a dye, um, it, using that same wavelength. Okay? And then nucleic acids, we typically measure their concentrations at 260 nanometers, so all of that is still possible. And when you and I begin to characterize them, we're normally concerned, generally speaking, in two ways, right? Which is, what is the amount of nucleic acid present? And how pure is it? Am I going to have concerns essentially as I make my way downstream, right? And then finally, as you think about AVs, viruses, capsids, right, those big particles that we talked about, um, if you remember their composition, it's mostly proteins and nucleic acids. So there's always ways to think of them, but they're again, they're just a big particle. And if you think about that, you have to worry about their relative size, um, choosing or differentiating some of them. And if you think about them as therapeutics, then certainly we should be mindful of how we are going to formulate them and the impact of excipients and other, other conditions, if you want, or different stages of development on their relative stability, right? And that's essentially what I want you to think about. And all of those things can be characterized with fluorescence, right? Can be characterized with UVBs, can be characterized with light scattering of, of some sort to assess the aggregation and the relative size of your particles. What we do at Unchained Labs essentially is we put together tools or instruments that are meant to make that characterization easier. What's exceptional about what we do is that we are focused exclusively on life sciences, which means that we are going to give you instruments that don't require a lot of samples. The first two on the left-hand side of your screen, the so-called lunatic and stunner, they measure concentration and the stunner itself measures concentration and size, and they only require two microliter per sample. The third one here labeled the uncle has three detectors built in and we'll go into that in more details, but this one only requires nine microliter sample. And then the honky gives you the ability to actually quantify your stability in a much more specific way. Okay? But I want to focus today's presentation on data. So I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but I just figured I will mention that as we, as we kind of go past those, those slides. But if you have any questions about any of them, feel free to reach out to the team here and we'll be able to assist you either through your local contacts and, and get you some specific answers to, to the questions that you might have and at the end of the presentation. But my focus here again is going to be the uncle to start with and then we'll get to, to the other ones as we can. So let's look at some real data, right? And really get a sense of what we are seeing here and make the best of the, the, the tool that we have in place. So when you and I think of biological, all right, all biopharmaceuticals and biologic characterization, those are typically what you have to do, right? Identify them, get a sense of their general stability, if you have impurities as you make your way downstream, those are the ways that they are characterized. And if you think about this approach, you can see that there's a number of tools, a number of parameters that are typically collected, right? But generally speaking, and what we do really well in Chain Labs is give you a sense of how you can assess all of those concerns using the exact same tools. And that's quite powerful because as you can tell, a lot of those tools 
they overlap, but really in, some of them are very unique. They're very specific to some characteristics or some concern that you might have. They require specialized skill sets, right? And it makes it quite challenging to get to the results that you may want to. Imagine being able to leverage one tool and you can actually use that same tool and carry it all the way through your entire process. And that, that's what we can do, right? And so I want to start this presentation by going over so-called AEVs, right? So the adeno-associated viruses. There are tiny little viruses that are typically accompanying uh, adenoviruses or other larger ones, right? And they've become very interesting in the so-called gene therapy business, right, or the gene therapy world. And the idea there, again, is to use that very interesting vector or vehicle or delivery mode to deliver nucleic acids into a cell and hopefully um, address some disease or correct some malfunction of that cell and, and the surrounding tissues. Okay? And so we're going to see exactly how the uncle technology can help you characterize AVs and give you some very interesting perspective as to what's happening there in terms of stability. And that may also inform you on the overall performance of your biologics as a result of those changes in structure. So the Oncol technology is going to be key for us, right? So the, the Oncol itself is a multiplex platform, meaning that we have multiple detectors in one box. There's a full spectrum parameter that can go from 250 to 720 nanometer. And we can do both intrinsic and extrinsic fluorescence, meaning that you can measure your regular protein unfolding and we'll see exactly how that's done. And you can certainly rely on dyes to also assess unique characteristics and properties of your sample. The next detector here is going to be static light scattering. It's a very nice way to assess the, the aggregation of your sample, when it's forming, at what temperature, under what conditions. Finally, you have dynamic light scattering as the third detector. And this one is very nice to assess size, but also an idea of the homogeneity of your sample. Like, do I have my main protein or my main virus of concern? And is it beginning to aggregate? And to which extent is it aggregating? Right? And all of that can be also combined, if you want, with temperature, the ability to ramp up the temperature. Certainly, you can assess things at room temperature, but the ability to actually stress your sample by using a thermal ramp to be able to find the melting temperatures, the temperatures of aggregation, for instance, or what happens if you maintain a certain temperature over a long period of time to an isothermal, all of those things can be done using the Oncol platform. And again, it's still only using nine microliter of sample. So this is a bit of a poster which summarizes all of the applications or some of the applications which can be done with the, the Uncle. Uh, so you can see that there's quite a bit, TM, TAG, so melting temperatures, aggregation temperatures with the ability to measure size. We also have the ability to do BQ2, KD, and even GQ2. There are some isothermal evaluations there, right? And you've seen uh, on the upper right hand corner that there's also the ability to do CPRO for people who've done so historically. There are some refolding uh, studies built in and Gibbs free energy, so Delta G again is built into this one. So quite a few things are available to you. I'm going to focus today's presentation mostly around the melting um, applications, so the TM, TAG, with a little bit of sizing by DLS. And then we'll, we'll see exactly how just that one application can be extremely powerful in aiding you in characterizing your samples. So this is essentially the raw data for this application, right? So it's a full spectrum from 250 to 720. And what you are viewing here in the animation that you just saw, right, is a collection of all of the spectra that are collected at different temperatures. So as your protein undergo a change in structure, so as you go from essentially a folded structure to an unfolded structure, right, you can actually see exactly how that's impacting your, your fluorescence. So the little green or oh, turquoise um, seals that you see there, right, they're supposed to represent the tryptophan amino acid. And as your protein begins to unfold, the microenvironment around those amino acids are changing. And as those environments are changing, the actual emission spectrum is going to change as a result of it. And this is what you are seeing here. The software simply automatically collects all of those spectra at different temperatures, and then it then has the ability to process them and derive a number of parameters from those. Okay. And so if you were to run that one experiment, the TM, TAG with BLS, you'll be able to collect as many as eight data points using only nine microliter of sample. And that's a very powerful paradigm shift. It's a very powerful way of thinking about the way we do characterization, right? And so not only do you get your melting temperature and your onset temperature, you get your temperature of aggregation, both for so-called low and high concentrations. And you also have the ability to measure the size of your samples before and after you do your thermal ramp. And you can also measure 
the so-called polydispersity, which is um, a way of essentially assessing, again, the homogeneity or the relative distribution of particles in your sample as you subject it to different conditions, right? And again, the example here is based on temperature, but you can imagine assessing that based on excipients, like formulations, and other, uh, other factors. Storage condition, for instance, lots of things can be done using those detectors. This is just an example using thermal ramp as the, the readout. Okay? And so as you and I think about using those viruses, right, for, for therapeutics, one of the things that you are going to have to do, right, is assess both the actual capsid itself, right, so the actual virus container, right? And then you're going to also have to be mindful of the aggregation, right? And so AAVs are exceptional in that they are non-enveloped viruses. So what you are viewing here is directly the so-called nucleo, uh, nucleo capsid, right? So essentially what wraps the nucleic acid content, there isn't that secondary phospholipid bilayer, if you want, of membrane uh, that usually serves as an envelope that wraps up the nuclear capsid. And so if you are producing though, you have to be mindful of the actual integrity of your capsid, and certainly you also have to wonder whether your sample itself is aggregated, right? So these are things that we have to answer. And as you do so, you may also have to ask yourself, is the actual genetic material in the capsid, and is it staying within it? So in terms of assessing that, there are two models that are generally popular, right? So one of them is a so-called genome ejection. And so what this one is suggesting is that your capsid itself remains intact, or at least more or less globular, right? It keeps its original shape. And you begin to have the formation of small holes that allow some of your nucleic acid to essentially leak out or be ejected out of the actual whole capsid. Right? That's one of the models that you'll see out there. The other second approach is that you can also have what they call capsid disruption, meaning that the actual capsid itself falls apart and only or as it's falling apart, do you actually see a significant amount of nucleic acid content being released into the buffer or the serum or whatever it is that you're using to, to formulate or to keep track of those, those viral, viral compounds, okay? And so what you and I are going to see is how the different technologies that I mentioned can be used to assess those, those properties, okay? And so when it comes to capsid stability, right, what we are really seeing here is, is the actual protein itself intact, right? So a capsid is nothing more than a bunch of proteins stuck together and they simply self-assemble in the shape of a sphere, right? And then the other component of that is going to be, of course, aggregation. Do they actually stick to each other while they are still a capsid, or do they first unfold and fall apart, and then they actually aggregate? And as this is happening, again, the ultimate goal is going to be to keep track of whether or not you have nucleic acid content within the capsid, how much of it you have, right? The so-called empty to full ratio is something that people ask about quite a bit. And the ability to assess all of that in one platform is something that was missing until, until the uncle came around. So here's an example of what we'll do first using intrinsic fluorescence, right? So this is basically just looking at proteins. So you can think about the work that you can do with just a regular protein, a regular antibody. This is really no different because all a capsid is, it's just a big ball of protein, right? And in other words, anything else that your protein does as a single monomer, you should be able to more or less have the ability to assess it uh, by fluorescence at least when you have the entire capsid together. And so what we do is we look at the intrinsic region, so the region based on tryptophan primarily, and we add heat to your sample. And as we do so, we expect a protein to unfold as any protein will do as you subject it to an elevated temperature. And you can see that taking place here, right? Yeah. And so if you take this data and you process it, we're able to arrive at something like this. So if you look at the x-axis, you have the temperature here, right, which shows you a bit of a range here from 25 to 95 degrees. And then if you look at the y-axis, you have some indication of the fluorescence signal that you have. And so what you are tracking here is the unfolding, right, of your capsidal proteins, or the proteins that, which make up your capsid. And you can see that there are two parameters here. We're showing you both the so-called T onset and the TM. And you can note when the sample itself has reached the midpoint when it's going to unfold. And then certainly when that begins to unfold, the so-called T onset or the beginning of the unfolding event. In the example here, this was selected with AV9. And so this is done at a concentration of about five times 10 to the 12. And we can discuss the actual range of concentrations which can be measured, but they're pretty, it's a pretty dynamic range. And it's quite exciting, I think, for, for therapeutics um, scientists of all kinds. And so in addition to unfolding, you're going to also have to be mindful of aggregation, right? And so before we show you the unfolding data here, 
right? So here you're seeing the exact same data overlaid with the aggregation in green. And so what you are seeing on the right hand side essentially is the photon count, just the intensity. And there's a very simple rule in light scattering, which says that as particles become larger, right? So as they begin to aggregate, they scatter more light. And so as your protein is unfolding and it begins to aggregate, it's going to form larger and larger particles and therefore they should scatter more light. And this is kind of what you are seeing here. So as you reach this temperature of 74.5 degrees Celsius, you can see that there's a very nice increase in the green line or the signal or the intensity. And that's going to be a good indication that your sample is beginning to aggregate. What's exceptionally exciting here is the ability to note that the T onset and the T ag match each other, right? So the T onset is actually called the T, the, you know, the T onset, the temperature of onset of unfolding, and the T ag is actually called the T onset of aggregation, so the temperature at which the aggregation begins. And so the fact that those two parameters overlap very nicely is a good indication that what's causing the big aggregation event that we're seeing here is the actual unfolding of the protein which make up our capsid, okay? And so you can imagine that we can use that parameter in a very interesting way, and we'll see that over the next few slides here. So we also have DLS, or dynamic light scattering, right? And so we can measure that at the initial temperature, we can measure that at the final temperature. You could also do a thermal ramp with DLS or the size as your measurement. So you can look at the effect of temperature on the size of your samples. So AAVs are typically on the scale of about 20 to 30 nanometers. So the example here is showing up at 28.7. And you can see that after we heat up the sample to 95 degrees Celsius, the size increases to well over 1,000 nanometers or one micron, right? So it gets quite large. And so this gives you a very nice orthogonal or an additional confirmation that what you saw by fluorescence and SLS is in fact real, right? So you truly have a sample that has unfolded and aggregated, and you can see that its average size is much larger at the final temperature than it was at, at your initial temperature, okay? And so this is about just the capsid itself, and this is about its behavior as a protein, a ball of protein, basically, yeah? And so as you and I make our way to the other side of the spectrum, we can actually leverage dyes. And so DNA typically absorbs at 260, but it's a really weak emitter on its own when it comes to fluorescence. And so one of the ways that you can actually leverage that signal is by using a dye, right? So cybergold is a dye which is very specific to nucleic acids. And so you can use it for DNA or RNA interchangeably. And so for you who may be working with RNA instead of DNA, this exact same principle that I'm going to highlight here can be used for your, your applications, okay? And so in the example here, you simply take your capsids and you presume that your capsids contain some DNA within the actual um, capsid itself, right? And then you're going to add cybergold to your buffer in a very specific concentration that we can, we can share with you. And as you do so, you're going to then have um, a release of your DNA. And as it interacts with cybergold, we're going to see an increase in the intensity. So it's important to note that cybergold does not have a significant fluorescence or emission, right, when it is not bound to nucleic acid. In fact, its intensity begins to go up the larger the amount of DNA is, right? So the more DNA it bands to, the higher its signal is going to be until it's saturated or unless there's no more DNA to, to bind to one or the other, right? And so the example here is kind of showing you what you can see and you still have the ability to assess aggregation or the SLS signal at 473 nanometer. So if you look at the example, you can see a few things, which is that the green line is showing you the unfolding, but this time we're using the signal of the cybergold. Okay? And so what this is showing you is that as you begin to heat up your sample, you can see that the actual signal dips a little bit, but really it begins to go up. And that CM that you see here, right, is really the midpoint of the temperature, right, when DNA is being essentially bound to cybergold, and that is in fact what's causing your signal to go up. And so it plateaus because either reach a saturation point or there's nothing else happening, and by then everything is presumed to be mostly free, and your sample has completed its cycle. And then concurrently, you may also see that there's an aggregation event happening here, just around 74 or so, 75 degrees as we saw before. Now what you will note is that this is the exact same sample, right? And previously I showed you a melting temperature which coincided very nicely with the temperature of aggregation. As you look here, you might see that the melting temperature here is, happens much earlier than what we saw before. And this is actually telling you that the DNA 
is actually ejected, right, or it comes out of the capsid before your capsid completely unfolds and aggregates. And so the beauty of having the ability to measure the two of those two different events, if you want, independently of one another, is that you can actually objectively assess both the ability of your capsid to just remain intact, but also its ability to retain the DNA, which is ultimately what makes it an interesting therapeutic. And that's, the re that's where the real value comes from, right? So we want to be able to assess those two factors. Here you can see that there's a range of 5 to the 11th to 5 to the 14th for AVs, which is a pretty you know, dynamic range of three folds or so. And it gives you lots of flexibility in terms of what you can do as you begin to assess your serotypes. And then by the time you have one day you can concentrate, you can certainly leverage the full range of the, of the instrument. Okay. So, so far, what do we know? We know how much DNA we have, right? We know how much we are going to, sorry, no. what we know is that we know, sorry, when the capsid begins to fall apart, we know when it's going to aggregate. We know that we can also track when the DNA is ejected from the capsid. And we know that those two events are independent of one another to some extent, right? So that means that I can actually say that if you were to give me some sort of capsid, I can tell you when it unfolds and when it remains intact. And then if you were to also give me um, a capsid with DNA or nucleic acid of any kind, I can tell you when that nucleic acid makes it out of my, my capsid, right? So that's quite interesting and a very powerful way to think of it. Now, the, in, the other thing that you may be interested in assessing is how much DNA do you have at the beginning, right? And so in a relative way, we can actually do so. If we were to look at the intensity of the um, cybergold dye at the beginning of your experiment, you can simply note what the, the intensity is, that count, and use that as your starting point. And that gives you a baseline of how much DNA you have. And so we show you an example here where we did a few dilutions just to show you the dynamic range and the percent CD of the instrument. And you can see that it's quite respectable, right? That um, over the entire measurements here, we don't really exceed 5%. This is quite nice. And this is a measurement that is done at room temperature. So in other words, this measurement is actually collected here by simply registering the area or the count of the cybergold signal. This measurement takes no more than one second per point, right? So it's actually quite fast. And so if you think about what people are doing right now, if you wanted to quickly assess the relative amount of DNA you have relative to your endpoint, for instance, this is much faster and that can allow you to work through a lot more samples without having to, to extend too much effort. And then finally, after you've essentially denatured your capsid, you may want to also know how much DNA you have at the end. And again, this is really, really fast. You can see that here we're looking at, again, a dynamic range that's pretty, pretty generous. And as we do so, we can still assess the amount of DNA um, present with pretty, pretty good reliability of those measurements. And again, those are really fast measurements that you can do as you assess the other factors related to stability. Okay. Now, so now we know when the capsid falls apart, right? We know exactly when DNA comes out of it. We have a sense of being able to assess how much DNA we have within the capsid and how much DNA we have outside of it before and after the actual thermal ramp, for instance. The other thing that you want to know is how much capsid do you actually have, right? And so the relative concentration is important. Now, typically, you know, if you're trying to assess the so-called titer, right, the actual amount of virus that you have present, um, there are a few ways to do so, and each of them has a certain level of complexity. One of the easiest ways to do so is to leverage the intensity, right, as a count for your particles. So if you look at the left-hand side, what we did here is we simply looked at the intensity of our DLS detector, and because our DLS is extremely reliable and we have pretty, pretty exceptional metrics around the performance of those systems, you can see that we can reliably measure the intensities over a pretty wide range. And as we do so and we plot that versus known concentrations of AV, we're able to then have this standard curve, right, of sort that we can then use to back calculate the concentrations of future AV batches, for instance, right? So on day one, you come in, you take some AV that you have, we simply do a dilution series, you measure the, the intensity, and then you have this curve that you have there. And then once you have it, um, if you know the following week, the following you know, month or so, you have to quickly just get an idea of the concentration, you can simply take a, an intensity measurement, which again happens really quickly, less than one minute, and then um, you can simply then extrapolate that back to your curve. So what you're doing on the right hand side is what happens when we try to look at the correlation between known concentrations and then some of the unknown that were then extrapolated from the, those measurements. And you can see that in those cases, we match very nicely. 
and you can see again the R square value being being pretty pretty remarkable there. Right. So now you have the ability to measure the particle count. You have an idea of the relative amount of DNA that you have before and after, right? And so now we can begin to think about the so-called empty to full ratio. In other words, how much, how many capsid particles, if you want, or viral particles do I have? How much DNA is present in my solution? And what is the relative amount of DNA relative, amount, relative to the capsid that I have? And that will give you a sense of the relative packing order, if you want, or the efficiency of your, of your therapeutic. Now, this isn't a method that's necessarily final, right? But as you're doing your development, this is a very fast way to assess those things. And that will certainly make it a lot easier for you to work through a very high sample, sample load if you have to. So let's take a look at this. In the literature, you can find information that basically tells you that unfolding, right, is actually impacted by the formulation. In other words, every sample behaves differently in different buffers, right? And that should not really be surprising. In other words, your proteins, if you want to simply take the proteins that you have right now and you want to reformulate them in different buffers, you expect the performance to be different. This is no different for capsids or viruses because they're nothing more than big balls of protein, right? And so as we do so, you can see an example where we put the serotypes. In other words, the different types of AVs that you can find. And you can note here on the y-axis that there's a melting temperature being shown. And as, you're, as you go through the actual list, you can see that each AV has a different melting temperature. But I want to bring your attention to AV5, for instance. You can see that this one stands up, all right, and stands off, if you want, above everything else. In, in other words, irrespective of the actual buffer that you're using, this one has a very high TM. And so if you are trying to find the, um, the most suitable AV for a given application, in this case, you may think that AV5 is the way to go, right? And that would be reasonable based on the actual data that you're viewing there, okay? And then you may also think about the alternate situation where you may actually have to decide um, which is the right formulation for that sample. And so I'll bring your attention to AV3, and you can see as you work your way through here that in this one here, it's pretty clear that TRIS, right, is the most suitable buffer as it yields the highest TM among the different buffers evaluated for AV3, okay? And so the uncle allows you to do this type of evaluation pretty nicely and pretty directly because we measure TM very easily. So you can easily compare a number of different conditions, right? The uncle can measure as many as 48 different samples at once, right? So that means that if you were to imagine 48 different conditions or 48 different buffers or excipients all running at the same time, and that will give you 48 different TMs, TAGs, sizes, all of that all at the same time within the same run. So it's a much more high throughput run than you can do with any other technique on the market. And that will only still consume nine microliter per cuvette. So this is an example of looking at the impact of excipients. So those are AVs which were measured both in PBS, like just standard PBS, and in PBS with arginine. You can see that in this case, the addition of arginine actually works against you, where the melting temperature decreases by about 6.4 degrees or so. And then the actual melting temperature, right, as we look at the cyber gold, is also impacted quite significantly, right? You can see a difference here that's pretty much near almost 13 degrees or so in, in difference. And so this is a very nice way to assess the impact of your, your excipients as you are doing some formulation development. And as you think of this, I want you to really keep that in mind, right? That using the uncle, you have the ability to assess stability, you have the ability to assess aggregation, right? But it's really the ability to do the work that you have to do, which is to find the right AV that you have to use to find the right environment for it, right? And to certainly begin to assess how much of that environment allows you to give as much of your DNA within the capsid as you can, right? And as you and I screen different serotypes, you can also see that they are easily distinguished on our platform. So what you're viewing here is AV2 and AV9. And so the first column of the table that we have below shows you some of the melting temperatures that were measured by CIPRO, right? So you have to use a dye just to get a very basic melting temperature. On our platform, you don't have to do this, right? So the second column shows you the actual melting temperatures measured using the uncle. And you can see that the actual TM and, and um, uh, for both the AV2 and the AV9 are very much close to one another. And then as you make your way to the genome ejection column, so the third data column here, you can see that the melting temperatures again are very different 
and you still have the ability to get aggregation on the exact same sample all at the same time. And so it's quite nice. Okay. And so that's a bit of the other benefits there, right? So now we can differentiate serotypes. We can differentiate um, the impact of buffers, right? Different excipients, for instance, different conditions. We know that we can see how much relative DNA we have present. We can also even assess the amount of particles present, right? So viruses are not that scary anymore, right? Because you can think about them in very simple ways. They're nothing more than a mixture of protein, nucleic acids, and it's just a big particle that's going to either aggregate or not aggregate, and we want to be able to keep track of when that takes place. Another interesting phenomenon that can happen, particularly in the early stages, right, as you begin to find the right serotype, as you begin to actually express it, it may become difficult to optimize your purification process at the beginning, right? That takes quite a bit of specific um, effort here. And so what we wanted to show you is the ability to also run mixed um, serotypes. And so if you had a mixture of different AAVs, which are running concurrently, so in the example here, you can see in blue that we have AV2 and then we have AV9 in green, and you can see the overlay of those. So you can see what happened when we run the two of them at the same time, uh, which is going to be the yellow curve there. And so if we start on the left-hand side, which is going to be just the intrinsic fluorescence, you can see here that the melting temperature that you find for the AV2 is still very much present when they're mixed together. And the melting temperature they get for the AV9 is still very much present when you look at the mixture of AV9 and AV2, right? And then on the right-hand side, as we look at the SLS intensity or the aggregation, we also see that we have the ability to measure both at the same time. So again, I can see that for my AV2, that CAG event, right, that first peak here, that first um, mountaintop, if you want, is visible here as the first transition. And the second aggregation event that we see for AV9 is very much visible here whenever we have a mixture of those two serotypes running concurrently. Right. And so when you think about the UNCO itself, the platform, and when you think about characterizing viruses specifically, right? Because viruses are going to be with us for the next, for the foreseeable future, to be, to be quite frank. And they're not just this annoying thing that can disrupt your life, right? They're a very powerful tool that is and will continue to be leveraged in the development of therapeutics going forward. So the idea of gene therapy has arrived. It is the next frontier. I think antibodies dominate for some time and they are going to stick around. But certainly the next major effort, the next major source of investment for a lot of the big biopharmaceutical companies out there is going to be gene therapy. And we see, uh, we've seen an explosion of departments in gene therapy over the last few, few months, if not a couple of years or so. And this is going to require people that understand how to characterize stability around proteins, and certainly around nucleic acids and also can treat the virus as a particle and can assess whether or not they're aggregated, right? And so when you think about the challenges that you have in those spaces, it's going to have to do with what you classically do with proteins, which is how stable is it? How deliverable is it? Meaning that do I have to be worried about the aggregation in the long term or under different conditions, right? And then the, the interesting bit is because it is a particle, you also have to know how much of it you have. In other words, what is the actual titer? And when we say titer, that term is used pretty interchangeably, meaning that we mean both do you have an idea of your concentration for the actual nucleic acid present, uh, but we also mean do you have an idea of the concentration of the actual virus there and how much or how many of those virons, those viral particles contain nucleic acid, right? And all of these things are things which can be done today using the Uncle platform. So what I want to do now is take you to an example where we're going to look at the VLPs, right? So we mentioned AVs quite a bit. I'm going to show you just another type of virus-like particles. And so VLPs are both found in naturally occurring um, situations, or they can also be synthetically prepared. Uh, but the whole idea, again, is to create a spheroid or a spheroid-like uh, particle that has some surface proteins or components or features which look like a virus, right? And you can either present them as an empty vesicle or you can present them with nucleic acid content. And so what I'm showing you here again is characterization done where we can show the melting temperature of different uh, VLPs. And you can see as they were ranked here by um, their melting temperatures, you can still be look quite different. And I'm going to take your attention to perhaps the fifth one here that had a melting temperature of 84.2, which is the one that you see to the far right. And then this one here, which had an early onset, which we see here at 71.4. 
Um, but the gist of it is that they, they all behave differently, right? Just by the nature of their, their type or their properties. And the uncle has the ability to differentiate those. And that's the beauty of having melting temperature, but certainly fluorescence as your readout, right? In addition to that, they're all going to have different colloidal properties. In other words, they're all going to have different aggregation propensity. And so what you are viewing here are the TAG values for those, some of the samples. And so for the one shown here again, I will distinct, distinguish if you want BP8 as the one that's the most stable one with the highest temperature of aggregation. And you can see that BP6 and BP7 are relatively close to each other. And for those, we noted uh, aggregations of 73.2 and 75.7 respectively. Okay. And so continuing the virus theme, I want to show you the other two platforms that we have, the so-called lunatic and stunner, right? And so the lunatic measures UV viz. Um, the simple volume here is only two microliters. You can run 96 well plates, or you can run as many as 10 96 well plates in one experiment. And then the stunner came after that, where we simply took the UV viz platform that we had, which was pretty exceptional, and we added the DLS within that sample, um, you know, holder, if you want that instrument. And this one is able to run the same number of samples, so 96 samples. It still only requires two microliter of sample. And we're able to do quite a bit, as you can see, concentration for your UVVs. And that is both for protein and nucleic acid samples and even plasma QC. So other types of um, samples can be done. We can also do colorimetric assays, so brand current, so on and so forth. And then we also have the ability to do the DLS here. The sample holder, as you can see, just a regular nice x well plate with a pretty unique sample holder. And on the same exact sample on which we measure your concentration, at the same time, during the same run, we can also measure the actual size of that sample and assess the aggregation. You can also look at just how precise or how well performing that system is. The accuracy is typically within 2% of expectation and the precision is well within 1% of um, the reproducibility that you're going to look for in your measurements. And the way we do so is because we have a fixed path length so you're going to get the same performance time after time uh, over any length of time, if you want, as we, you know, your samples evolve, as you come back and measure the same sample periodically. If you are doing QC, this is exceptionally relevant to make sure that you're getting reliable measurements that you can trust. When it comes to DNA, right, you want to make sure that you know exactly how much you have as you make your way downstream, okay? And so this is really what's interesting here. So it's UVVs plus DLS. But I'm going to take you a step further and show you what makes our platform different is that we've added the ability to deconvolute, right? So you give me two microliter of sample. It is not enough to tell you how much sample you have. It's important to tell you how much actual sample you have, right? And so what you're seeing here is a deconvoluted spectrum. So the, the black spectrum that you see here is the ensemble. That's what you would measure as your regular absorbance. And if you deconvolute that, in other words, if you break it to the different components that are present, you can see that we're showing you here an absorbance at 260, which is a nucleic acid component, and we're at 280 because that sample had some protein contaminant that we can distinguish pretty nicely in this sample. So again, if you have samples that are a mixture of different things, sometimes it is useful to be able to assess how much of it is true nucleic acid, or how much of it is true protein, and how much of it can be other contaminants from other steps of extractions that haven't quite cleaned up your sample. And this can be done using the exact same platform. You don't have to remeasure your sample can simply reprocess the actual spectrum directly within the software. For the DLS bit, uh, we can look at viruses pretty nicely. So these are just examples of uh, viruses that we ran on the stunner. Uh, and you can see that we get the same results that we get on the stunner for the DLS as we do on the onco. Those are other VLPs that we ran on those platforms. And you can see if you take the samples and you heat them up um, from 15 to 95 degrees, you can see the differences in behavior that we see that are quite interesting here. And as your sample begins to get larger, you can see a change in the size as a function of the, the treatments and the differences in the samples, right? And so what you're viewing here isn't just um, the actual distribution, the number of peaks present, but you can actually get a much more resolved idea of the specific compositions of what you have there and the extent that you may have a given proportion of one to the other. How much aggregates are you getting? Um, and you can assess that pretty, pretty nicely, okay? And so we're getting close to the end here, but I want to kind of remind you of what Unchained does and what we're discussing here, right? So it's the idea of having tools that can help you through the entire process. Uh, and so right now, most of um, our customers, most of our users, most life sciences, if you want, have very 
uh, disjointed, right, um, workflows and systems that they're working with. They come from different vendors, they have different software, they have different simple requirements, and they were not made for proteins. What makes us very unique is that from the onset, from the beginning, we decided to create instruments that were just for life, sci life sciences. And as a result of it, they are very mindful of how much sample they consume. They also are very much geared to measure multiple things at once to give you as much information as you can from your very precious samples. And so as you think about the onco and the big lunatic and stunner, from very early stages all the way down to the end of your process, these platforms can help you. And we certainly have other platforms as well, the Big Tuna, which can do workflows, so buffer exchange, for instance, very nicely. We have the Hound, which can assess the, the composition and, and the quality of your, your sample holders, for instance, and look for other contaminants. And we have a series of technologies and instruments which can make it much easier for you to characterize your samples as you develop therapeutics. And you can rest assured that you won't be by yourself. Uh, we have placed over 2,800 systems around the world. This is an example of some of the companies that are using our, system, uh, our instruments right now. And many of them have multiple instruments in place and they're well integrated. And so this gives you a very good idea that you, know, you, are, going to, you are going to be surrounded by peers which have accepted our technologies and are using them to make the same critical decisions that you have to make as you're developing their, their therapeutics. So thank you very much. And I'll pass it on to Leo. Now, thanks, Rifa. I know there is tons more to be said on the topic, um, but I thought that was a really great introduction and summary of uh, some of what can be done. Uh, we've got some great questions already, but I would also just remind you guys, uh, we have about another 10 minutes. If you like, the Q&A box is still open, so please feel free and uh, ask us more questions. Um, for now, let's see. So one of the very early questions was, how long does it take for one experiment? That's a good question, yes. So if we're discussing the on-call, um, it can take about an hour and a half to run your samples. And it doesn't matter whether you have one sample or 48 samples, it's really fast. So the maximum throughput is 48 samples, but depending on your temperature ramp rate, uh, that can certainly impact the length of your experiment. But in average, one hour and a half isn't unusual for, for that platform. For the stunner, it typically takes about, uh, we normally say that it takes about five minutes or so to run an A6 well plate, so it's really, really fast. Um, as you're running DLS and, and EVVs, that can take a little bit longer, up to you know, like an hour or so because of the DLS, but certainly you can have a pretty considerable amount of data for an A6 samples in one hour. You're looking at roughly 37 seconds per sample. Um, of your system, what's the best one to do buffer screening? Oh, good question, yes. So that one's going to be the big tuna. Uh, and so it's not sure a picture of it there, but that one has the ability to do your buffer exchanges very nicely. So buffer exchange. If you're doing buffer screening, sorry, it's not corrected. Yes. Uh, for buffer screening, sorry. You can use actually the uncle, for instance. So this one has the ability to measure fluorescence. So if you're looking at protein and their stability, in different conditions, and the uncle is very well suited for that, both in terms of its ability to measure structure, aggregation, size, right, both in real time, but also the B22KD can give you an idea of the propensity to aggregate over time for your samples. Uh, the stunner is also really nice because it has DLS built in, and it's a very nice way to screen very quickly um, the aggregation, for instance, in your samples as you switch buffers. And so you mentioned cyber gold, but you also, um, you know, mentioned vaccines. So with cyber gold binding to DNA, mm -hmm. why would you use for RNA? Same thing. So exactly. So cyber gold is specific to nucleic acids, right? It binds to the nucleotides yeah. present in the, in the backbone. So you can actually use it for both DNA and RNA. We have customers who are doing BLP development where they're actually using RNA as the the nucleic acid content within the capsid, and you can certainly do that and get the same performance. And so, um, and maybe we'll make that the last question for today. We can answer everything else offline as well. Um, but can you do uh, the, the melting temperature and the cyber gold at the same time? You can, yes. So it's, it's one application, it runs concurrently. Um, so you can certainly do the melting temperature using cyber gold, so that's one way to do it. Or you can do the intrinsic fluorescence um, and the cyber gold at the same time 
using one of our applications, or you can use a specialized application which separates one from the other, but we give you the full flexibility of choosing which one makes the most sense for your samples. Great. Thank you. Excellent. So I think, I think that's maybe it for today then. Um, so I want to thank all of you for the great questions and also for joining us today and so very many of you. Um, I know right now people are working from home a lot, so this is probably a good time to figure out some new tools in how to um, handle your research challenges as you hopefully get to go back to your lab very soon. Um, all of this will be on YouTube. We will send you those links as well. And you're welcome if you want to have some deeper conversations on how to use the technology to come to us to go to your local distributor. Did I not, did I mention to totally miss that? Thank you, Rifar, for going back. So, nope, forward. All right, so those are in your respective countries, um, the distributors you uh, need to contact. So Australia, New Zealand, it's Millennium, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, it's Science Worker, South Korea, we have got Cheyenne, India is Primas, Taiwan, J and H, and you can of course come to us. Um, so thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks everyone. And again, as a reminder, feel free to submit your questions in the chat and we'll answer them offline in follow-up emails. Thank you. Thanks.